Good day, and wow, it's really good to be here with you. This is, uh, well, I'm taping this, or recording this, pardon me, uh, just a, a day before October. October is upon us tomorrow. And uh, just so grateful for you all, and pray that God has uh, kept you close to himself, and blessed you, and, and um, provided you opportunities to just to really tell other people about the goodness and graciousness of our Lord. And thank you for inviting me into your homes and places. And we might as well get started today. Today I want to introduce you to prisoner number 20, uh, 2491. And we go to the 1930s and the rise of the Nazi regime in Germany. And there the German church was faced with some serious challenges. Conform to the ideological vision of the National Socialist German Workers' Party and its leadership or face severe consequences. And history records that a number of pastors and church leaders did bow their heads and sided with the new masters of Germany and decided to conform rather than lose their positions. Other pastors and church leaders such as Martin uh, Niemuller, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and Paul Schneider, to name a few, formed what came to be known as the Confessing Church. These were the Christians who would not bow the knee to Nazism, but confess their one and only allegiance to Jesus Christ, and no matter what may come their way. Not long after their resolution, the German state police began to persecute the Confessing Church, and Pastor Paul Schneider, an outspoken uh, pastor in the Confessing Church, who was faithful to the biblical truth, found himself in such a situation. In 1937, Pastor Schneider, now given the designation prisoner number 2491, said to his wife in a letter, I foresee a time when every sincere Christian will be compelled to openly confess and freely declare their faith. The postmark on the letter to his wife Marguerite was Buchenwald concentration camp. And the journey to Buchenwald for Pastor Schneider was a difficult one. For you see, the Gestapo had labeled his biblical preaching as psychologically deviant. And they came to the conclusion that the only place for Pastor Schneider was in the concentration camp. And of the two years that prisoner number 2491 was at Buchen Buchenwald, 18 months was spent in solitary confinement. His crime for doing this was holding devotions in the barracks and things like preaching the gospel and helping others out. One time, prisoner 2491 said this, There's no spot on me that has not been beaten black and blue. You see, the guards in their brutality often would set their dogs on him and, or beat him with their whips. And these kinds of things were a regular occurrence over the two years of his incarceration. But despite the brutality of the guards, his confinement, prisoner 2491 refused to conform to the Nazi regime. For to conform would mean his freedom, but deny his Savior, Jesus Christ. Then a fateful day arrived, July 18, 1939, the pastor Paul Schneider was murdered with a lethal injection administered by camp doctor, SS Major Erwin Dingschuler. And his wife, Marguerite, was afforded 24 hours to retrieve her husband's body, which had been nailed into a coffin so that no one could see how badly he had suffered. Pastor Schneider's funeral was attended by hundreds of pastors and church leaders despite the tight security and constant surveillance from the state police. And we know, uh, we can just know through history that Paul, Pastor, Pastor Paul Schneider and his martyrdom rallied the Christians in their boldness and proclamation of the true gospel of Jesus Christ in the face of evil. Another confessing church pastor, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who will later be imprisoned and executed by the Nazis, was in London at the time when he heard about Pastor Paul Schneider's death. He gathered his family around him and said to them, Children, you must never forget the name of Paul Schneider. He is our first martyr. Well, please turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 3. We're going to 
read the whole chapter. It's uh, 30 verses, but uh, we want to get the whole sort of context and, and the story in, in our minds. Chapter 3, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits, and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the perfects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the perfects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and tribes, that when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Verse 7, Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the, peoples, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, the pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down, fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fire, burning fiery furnace. Verse 12. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into the burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men who bow, were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery fur furnace. Because the king's order was urgent, the fire and the furnace overheated. The flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shad Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like the son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning, fir fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And the satraps, the perfects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come, up, uh, had come upon them. 
Verse 28. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speaks anything about, against the, gods, the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb for limb and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And now we commit this time into your hands, O Holy Spirit of the living God. Uh, guide us through this. Help us to understand and to put into practice the truths that we learn from this message today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we are, um, after a brief pause, last week we took a pause from the book of Daniel. Now we're back at the book, in the book of Daniel here in chapter 3, which we just read together. And we don't come here today as newbies. We have spent some time in this Holy Spirit inspired book and have uncovered, uncovered biblical truths. We've learned that God is sovereign over our lives. We saw this in Daniel chapter 1 and 2. And we see it here in Daniel chapter 3, the sovereign, he's, that God is sovereign over all things. We turn to the wisdom of Proverbs, who puts it this way, the heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. That's Proverbs 16, 9. Job put it another way when he said in Job chapter 42, 2, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Friends, God is sovereign, period. We also learned that there are times when our faith in Christ will be tested and we will need to decide where to draw the line in the sand. We learned that sometimes God will allow trials and tribulations to come into our lives for his purposes and our own good. And the question that is always before us when these things happen, whatever they may be in our lives, is how will you and I respond? And Daniel has shown us that a life of humility and humble uh, humility before God, trusting God in prayer, seeking his wisdom, will hold us in times of trials and tribulations, and in everyday life, actually, will hold us and guide us, even if God does not remove us from the trouble. Yet he will bring us through, as he did these three faithful servants of God in the furnace. These were the internal truths that we bring to our story today. And as we take some time with the events in this text, we have context as our foundation. The events described here in chapter 3 of Daniel happened to the nation of Israel, uh, the nation of Judah, pardon me, happened to the Jewish people, happened to three specific individual Jewish men. And the story has more to do with the history of Israel and their covenant with God than the blood-bought church of Jesus Christ. Yet, because it is inspired by the Spirit, there is biblical truth that speaks through all the ages here in Daniel chapter 3. And that's what we're going to try and glean from here. So we want to break this story down, these 30 verses, into smaller bites. And let's deal with verse 1 to 7. And verse 1 to 7 sets the stage, if you will, for the challenge that will come to the three faithful servants of God. We go back to the end of chapter 2. We see there that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had found favor with the king and were placed, according to the 49th verse of chapter 2, over the affairs of the province of Babylon. They were leaders in the province of Babylon. One thing we should notice here with verse, with verse 1 and 7 is the details. It's very detailed uh, seven verses. For example, we see we are given the actual height and the width of the golden statue that Nebuchadnezzar built at 90 feet tall and so many feet wide. And we are given the statue's location, which is strategically placed in the plains of Dura, so all could see. We see the gathering of all the officials from all the kingdom for the dedication of the image that the king himself had commissioned. And the proclamation is told that peoples, nations, and languages are commanded, that's verse 4, are commanded when the orchestra begins to play to 
what? Fall down and worship the golden image. Verse 5. That the, commission, the king commissioned himself. I'm going to repeat myself a couple of times. And there's a dire warning given by the herald that anyone who does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Verse 6. And we see when that very first note was played, they all fell down and worshiped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Verse 7. So here's the point. These seven verses are very detailed. But the mere fact that the king's name was mentioned four times in the text should be enough for us to understand and highlight that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were facing an unavoidable confrontation. A confrontation that would test their faith as it was never tested before this day. We fast track forward now in time to the 20th century, specifically January 8, 1956. And Christian missionary Jim Elliott and four others who had spent a lot of time trying to make inroads in the Ecuadorian jungle with the elusive and violent Harani tribe they, had, they tried all sorts of things to make that first contact. In that time, on January 8, 1956, they faced a confrontation that would test their faith as it was never tested before. For their plans and hopes changed in a moment's notice when ten Harani warriors attacked and killed all five missionaries. Go back to our text now. We're looking at verse 8 to 15. And we see it begins with a harmful intent, a malicious intent, as some had gathered around the king and maliciously accused the Jews, verse 8. These accused, accusers reminded the king of his decree that they were all commanded the very first note of that orchestra to fall down and worship the golden image, and that those who did not fall down and worship, they were to be cast into the fiery furnace, verse 10 and 11. In other words, these, these uh, malicious uh, folks were intending to harm or intending harm for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego for not serving the Babylonian gods and not bowing down to the golden image. They intended harm to the one serving the one true God. As we consider verse 13 now to 15 as a whole, at the very least, with, at the very least within these verses, we find the spiritual nature of an unbelieving heart, the spiritual nature of an unbeliever. And in our context, an uh, unbeliever who seemingly had unlimited power and control, and that would be King Nebuchadnezzar. For you see, folks, at the heart of an unbeliever then and today is what the Apostle, Apostle Paul called foolishness. We want to hear Paul's commentary on this. And we find that in his first letter, in his letter, pardon me, not his first letter, but his letter to the Romans, chapter 1, verse 20 and 22, where Paul said this, for his invisible attributes, that is God's invisible attributes, attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. You see, when the Bible calls someone a fool, it's not a joke. It's pretty serious. This is the true nature, the sinful nature of an unbelieving heart. It is foolish. God calls it foolish. You see the king here in our story, in his foolish thinking, his darkened thinking, futile thinking, gave Shadrach, Meshach, and, uh, and Abednego an ultimatum. And he said to them, but if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And then he said this, and who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Verse 15. We go back in time now to the time of the Exodus. And there we see one day Moses and Aaron going to see the Pharaoh. And they said to the Pharaoh this, Exodus 5, 2, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh, in his foolish thinking, answered, 
Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, moreover I will not let Israel go. Exodus 5, 2. Well, ten plagues later, in one sea crossing, the might of Egypt encountered the one true God, and their foolishness was brought to an end. If we go back to Daniel, we see here the king, who now could boast and threaten and decree, but it would not be long before the one true God would go to this very same king in a dream and bring his foolishness to an end. All would be taken from him, and his days would be filled with loneliness and lots of grass to eat. Check out Daniel chapter 4. Why? Well, for the fool then and the fool today, those who are fools today in all sorts of places, who don't acknowledge God, will one day know this, that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Daniel 4, 31, 33. Now we go to verse 16 to 18, and there we find the response to the king's threats. And to paraphrase, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, King, we don't need to defend ourselves against your threats. God has sufficient power, and he, and he may choose to save us and rescue us from the fire. And if God chooses to allow us to die, know this, King, we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image you made. And into the blazing fire went Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, this brings us to verse 24 to 30. And as we look at these last bits, these last verses, there's a number of ways we could parse the story to draw out an application for us today. Because the question always is before us, when we look at a biblical text and when we listen to a preacher, Lord, what do you want us today in our contest to take with us into our day-to-day -day lives? How will this help us, not if, but when our faith will be tested? We can see clearly here the, the faith and the sovereignty and power of God that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego demonstrated when tested. And, very, and here in verse 24 to 30, God's power is more than, more than able to keep even the hair of their heads from being singed from the superheated fire. We see clearly their submission to the will of God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could have chosen to bow to the king at this point in his gods and avoid the fire. We go back to Pastor Paul Schneider, who could have avoided all the beatings if he would have simply joined with the pastors who aligned themselves with the Nazis. We go to Moses. Moses could have ignored the cries of his people and continued tending his flocks. Jim Elliot, the missionary, could have stayed home and lived a long life. But folks, they didn't. Instead, they faced their situation, no doubt with trembling knees, and they said, but if not, we will not. But if God does not save us from this trial, we will not bow our knees to any other God or human agent. Well, friends, these and countless unnamed believers over the centuries, everyday ordinary folks, when faced with a test of faith, placed their trust in the sovereignty and power of God, whose will for them was more important than even life, themselves, and life itself. All these believers, then and today, have gone before us as an example of the power of the peace of God or the peace of Christ we'll have in our life if we submit our wills to him. Well, these spiritual blessings from God are not hidden from us here in the book of Daniel. They're right there in the story that we read today. And we can apply them to our lives today. But as our time uh, together draws to a close, there's another application for us to consider. And this is more about the witness, the effect of their wit the witness of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and their friend Daniel, when we look at the whole story, to the context they found themselves forced into. And we can say it with simply two words, a godly, a godly influence, godly influence. We cannot miss the godly influence these four faithful servants of God had on the royal court and the Babylonian empire as a, empire as a whole. Their response to the culture, their response to the threats and the trials 
had a great impact in ways we can probably never know completely today. In our story today, for example, King Nebuchadnezzar's response to his witness of the four men walking around in the midst of the fire would not have happened had not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego trusted fully in God. For you see, the king responded this way, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Please notice with me how much, the influence, how much influence these three godly men had on a pagan king. For he said, therefore I make a decree, any people, nation, and language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb for limb, and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue them in this way. Well, you might notice and focus on how God saved the three men from the flames. Or you might focus and, and notice how God rewarded the three men for their faithfulness. And that's fine to do that. But you might miss the bigger picture that I believe God and his sovereign will and purpose for his people brought about through these three godly men. See, King Nebuchadnezzar, by his very decree, ensured the safety of all the Jews of the Babylonian Empire ensured that the Jews would be able to worship God without threat of death. And God did this through the godly influence of three of his servants. We think of Jim Elliot and his friends who had been trying all sorts of things to bring the gospel to the isolated, isolated tribes in Ecuador. It cost them their lives, but we know the rest of the story for their godly influence won over one of the most feared tribes in the region to Christ even some who had killed them. Pastor Paul Schneider's godly influence will only really be known in heaven, friends. Every day from his cell for 18 months, when thousands lined up for roll call, he would loudly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ through the bars of his jail window. Can I ask you, how many lives will you touch for good or bad in your lifetime? A fellow by the name of Brad Zeck proposed that if a person meets an average of two to three people a day, and assuming the average lifespan is 80 years, means the average person will encounter between 60,000 and 80,000 people in their life. And here's Brett's point. Each person you have met represents at least one opportunity you have had to influence the trajectory of their lives. Listen to the Apostle John. In his first letter, chapter 4, verse 20, 21, he said this. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has not seen, pardon me, cannot love God whom he has seen. And this commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. And I should add, sister. God has commanded us to love one another as brothers and sisters. Jesus said the greatest commandment is to God love with all that we have and to love our neighbor as ourselves, which is anyone and everyone. Jesus also said, uh, you're taught to hate your enemies. And he said, no, don't hate your enemies. Love your enemies. You see, you want to influence someone? Do you want to influence a person that you might meet? like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Love God and love your neighbors as yourself. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this message, and we commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for having me. God bless you richly, my dear friends. Shalom.